Today we're going to be talking about protein synthesis and protein sorting. And as I mentioned to you in class, I think this is one of our more difficult topics because it's very rich in detail. And the reason it's so rich in detail is because there are many different processes of sorting and trafficking protein around the cell depending on where the protein is going to end up. We'll approach this topic by dividing it into some review material and then um, we'll go into some pro post translational processing things like protein cleavage and chemical modifications that are made to proteins and putting more than one protein together to form what's called a multimeric protein. We'll go on then after that to talk about how proteins are targeted to various destinations in the cell, how they're sorted depending on whether or not they're um, going to end up in um, the membrane of the cell or the cytosol of the cell or some other location within the cell. We'll talk about co-translational import of proteins. We'll talk about post-translational import of proteins. Um, and we'll also talk about integral membrane proteins as we work through. So the first thing we need to do is talk a little bit about vocabulary. When we talk about protein trafficking, when you hear that term or read that term, what that refers to is a process involving movement of proteins from one part of the cell or one compartment in the cell to another. So that term is very generic. This is, again, just the process where things are getting moved around from one part of the cell to another. When you hear the word protein targeting or protein sorting, that's more specific. So that's a type of protein trafficking where signals on the protein are telling where the protein is going to end up, where it's going to be located and how it's going to be sorted to end up in that destination. So protein trafficking is the more generic term and protein targeting or sorting is the more specific term. Another uh, couple of vocabulary terms for us are the difference between a peptide, a polypeptide, and a protein. I tend to use the word protein very generically, but technically a protein is a folded polypeptide. A polypeptide then is a chain of more than 50 amino acids in the primary structure, so in some specific order. If you hear the term peptide, what, a, what you're um, being referred to is a chain of amino acids that's less than 50 amino acids in the primary structure. So generally a peptide is the smallest unit of a protein. A polypeptide is a bigger peptide and then once a peptide or polypeptide is folded it technically becomes a protein. So some review material for us and hopefully this is all fresh in your mind. Uh, we can break protein structure into levels depending on the complexity of the protein. We can talk about the primary structure, the secondary structure, and the tertiary or most complex structure of a protein. When we talk about a primary structure of a protein, again, what we're talking about is simply a sequence of amino acids. So a chain or a group of amino acids that are in a particular order. And that order makes a difference because remember all the R groups that are coming off of each individual amino acid will interact with each other, will be attracted or repelled from each other, and will play a big role in how that chain of amino acid folds up to become a functional protein. When we talk about the secondary structure of a protein, we're talking about the first of those folding episodes. And there are two general secondary structures for proteins. One's called an alpha helix and one's called a beta sheet. And if you look over here at the diagram, you can see on the left hand side, there's a purple ribbon that demonstrates a primary protein or the primary structure of a protein, which is again just a chain of amino acids that are bound to each other in a particular sequence. Once that chain of amino acids begins to fold, there are two folded conformations it can assume. 
The first one is called an alpha helix, and as the name suggests, this is a structure that is helical. And the second one is called a beta pleated sheet, or just a pleated sheet. This is a more two-dimensional structure, more like a sheet. Now when you hear the, the term tertiary structure, you're talking about the three-dimensional folded structure of a protein. And that's simply the combination of all the alpha helices and beta sheets as they become attracted to each other and begin to form associations. Now there is one more level of protein structure that we don't always talk about because it doesn't always apply to every protein, and that's quaternary. The quaternary structure of a protein is only applicable when multiple proteins come together to work as a unit. So you have several polypeptides that fold and then assemble to make one large functional protein. That's quaternary structure. Now we've talked a little bit about amino acids in some past lectures. We talked about the basic structure of an amino acid having a, having a central carbon, which is attached to an amino group on one side, a carboxyl group on the other side, a single hydrogen atom, and then this R group. And it's the R group that determines the difference between each amino acid. So an R group can be any combination of carbons and hydrogens and oxygens and nitrogens. When two amino acids come together, they can form a covalent bond that's called a peptide bond. So again, just like a phosphodiester bond in DNA, a peptide bond is a specific type of covalent bond that forms between two amino acids. One end of a protein has, um, has the name the N terminus, and the other end of a protein has the name C terminus. That's because protein is simply a chain of amino acids and that means at one end of the chain the amino group is going to be exposed and at the other end of the chain the carboxyl group is going to be exposed so that's why we use those terms N and C. The other thing we should review is the process of translation um, and as we did for transcription, we're not going to talk in great detail about translation, just enough to get you started remembering what you've already learned in past courses. And of course, you can refer to old textbooks or to your current textbooks um, if you need to review for yourself in a little more detail the steps of translation. So, translation is the process where mRNA or messenger RNA is used to create protein. Remember the central dogma that DNA is transcribed to mRNA, that mRNA is translated into protein, and that protein then composes the traits, creates the traits that make up the phenotype of the organism. So after transcription occurs, the mRNA, at least in a eukaryote, has to get out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm for translation. And of course, that's going to happen in, through our old friend, the nuclear pore complex. Once it's in the cytoplasm, the ribosome needs to interact with the mRNA in order to begin the process of translation. Remember that ribosomes are not technically organelles because they're not enclosed by a membrane, but they are critical players in the flow of information in a cell because they guide this process called translation. Ribosomes are composed of protein and also a type of RNA called rRNA. And ribosomes have two subunits. They have a small subunit and a large subunit. The small subunit contains the site where the mRNA will bind. And the large subunit contains the catalytic or active site to make peptide bonds between individual amino acids. So the mRNA binds to the ribosome and then the ribosome quite literally travels down the length of the mRNA exposing individual codons one at a time. Now remember the codon is a unit of three bases on mRNA. 
um, as each individual codon is exposed by the large subunit, the tRNA, specifically charged tRNAs, are going to come in and match up anticodon to codon, the correct amino acid that belongs at that spot in the protein. Within the large subunit, there are these hollow channels where these charged TNAs will move one after the other, like an assembly line, in order to get that amino acid bound to the growing chain of protein. The first channel is called the aminoacyl site, that's the A site. The second one is called the peptidyl site, or the P site. And the last one is called the exit site, or the E site. Individual charged tRNAs come in, bind to the A site, then get shifted over into the P site, where the peptide bond will be formed, then shifted over into the E site, where they will eventually exit the ribosome and go back to become charged once again. So the three bases in the codon on the mRNA are going to form complementary bonds with the three bases in the anticodon on the tRNA. New amino acids are going to join together with peptide bonds to uh, create this chain of growing protein. After one amino acid comes in, the ribosome is literally going to move to the next codon. That's a process that we call translocation. Eventually, we'll get to the end of the mRNA, and that will be the stop codon. And the stop codon will signal a, um, a release factor to enter into the large subunit of the ribosome. And that release factor looks just like any other tRNA except it doesn't have an amino acid attached to it. So that will be the termination signal for the end of translation. This is a, an image that I like because it shows the whole process of transcription and translation on one slide. So this is obviously a eukaryotic cell because there's a nucleus in the purple area and cytoplasm in the orangey peach area. And as you can see, we've got an mRNA here that's been processed. Remember, that means that the introns have been removed and the exons have been spliced together. We've got a tail, a poly A tail, and um, a cap on uh, either end of the mRNA. It's coming through the nuclear pore complex and out into the cytoplasm. We have the individual components of the ribosome in brown. We have the small subunit and the large subunit. Remember, it's the small subunit that's originally going to bind to the RNA. And then the large subunit will come in and join. And as you can see, the uh, ribosome will then um, function to align each tRNA, shown in green, with the appropriate uh, codon so that the tRNA can bring in a purple amino acid and join it to the growing chain of protein. Now, a couple other points to remember. When we talk about translation, just like with transcription, there's differences in the process between prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. And just like we saw with transcription, the prokaryotic process is simpler than the eukaryotic process. When we talk about eukaryotic translation, we're talking about many more protein factors required at each step. It's just more complex as you would expect. The other thing we need to always remember when we're talking about proteins is that mutations will greatly affect, or at least can greatly affect, a protein that comes from a gene. Mutations, remember, are permanent changes in the sequence of bases in the DNA. So they alter the DNA. And that happens whenever a cell is preparing to divide and the DNA is replicated. If a mutation persists, if it becomes permanent, that DNA then has a new sequence. And that means that the mRNA that's made from that DNA is going to have a new sequence. And depending on how significant the mutation is, 
that change in the mRNA might produce a change in the protein. Um, if you can remember back to um, Bio 110 and evolution, we talked about two different large classes of mutations. We talked about point mutations and chromosomal level mutations. Point mutations, that, that term point means single base, single base mutations. And these, of course, can be base substitutions or insertions and deletions of a single base. And depending on where that base, that single base, is altered, sometimes the codon will be changed enough so that the protein will be different. A new amino acid will be inserted at that codon, will have a change in the order of amino acids in the protein, and that means the structure will change in the protein. Remember, anytime you change a protein structure, you're going to change its function. Chromosomal mutations are a lot more significant because we're talking about entire segments of a chromosome being altered through mutation. These can include things like inversions, where pieces of the chromosome break off, flip 180 degrees, and then reinsert. Translocations, where pieces of two chromosomes can switch places, and what we call gene duplication or deletion, where pieces of a chromosome can be duplicated during the synthesis process or completely deleted during the synthesis process. Because we're talking about a chromosome level mutation, we're no longer talking about a single codon and a single amino acid being affected. Now we're talking about many, many codons and many amino acids being affected. So chromosome level mutations tend to have a massive effect on the resulting protein. Okay, so enough of our review material. Now we're going to move on and start talking a little bit about what happens to a protein after it's created through translation. The first thing that happens is some basic processing and we refer to this as post-translational because this is going to happen once the ribosome is released from the mRNA and releases the new polypeptide so it can become a functional protein. And there are steps involved in processing that brand new polypeptide before it can be sent to its eventual destination in the cell. These steps include what we call modification, folding, of course, and sorting or trafficking to its final destination. Now, the organelles that do the work of post-translational post processing involve the endoplasmic reticulum, or the ER, the Golgi apparatus, remember, which is situated right next to the ER, and various transport vesicles, which, remember, are just little um, sacks of uh, membrane that will literally transport or carry proteins as they travel from one place to